Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome once again to the New Yankee Workshop. Over the next couple episodes, we have a project I think you're really going to enjoy, at least if your letters and emails are any indication. Now, many of you have said that you don't have the space to have a standalone workshop like we have here at the New Yankee Workshop, but you want to do woodworking. Well, how about a garage workshop where you simply move your car out of the way, roll the tools out, and build just about anything you want or see here in the New Yankee Workshop. Well, that's what we're going to do over the next two episodes. We're going to build the cabinets, the fixtures, and set the tools in place. You won't want to miss it. That's next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Well, here's the place we've picked to build our garage workshop. It's a pretty typical two-car garage. And does this look familiar? The garage is always the storage place of last resort. Everything ends up here. The construction is open wall, just studs and plywood, open ceiling joists, and we have a nice high space in here. Now let me show you what we're going to do on this side of the garage where we're going to set up the workshop. We have a space 22 feet long, 12 and a half feet wide. If you look down at the floor, you can see that when the vehicle is pulled in, the tire sits right about here. We have an advantage in this garage because there's about six feet of additional space to the side. Most garages have about three feet, which is still plenty to build your cabinets and have a place to store your tools. Now I left some of the ceiling open so I could show you what we did before we closed it in. We added some six inch insulation, then some one by three strapping onto the bottom of the joist. After that was done, we put this half-inch homoso. This stuff has been around forever. It's made out of recycled newspaper. It's about the same price as drywall, and it's very durable. I attach it to the strapping with roofing nails, just butting the joints together, and after that, just roll on a nice, bright paint. So, you know, most workshops are pretty dark. Uh, most garages are very dark and dingy, and we want to brighten that up. Now, this garage has the advantage of a heating system already installed. We have radiant heat. But if you didn't have that, you could put in a wood stove or some other choice of supplemental heat. The walls are all closed in. And once again, before the wall was closed in, I added insulation wherever it was necessary. Here, we had a concrete wall to deal with. So I had to build a stud wall here, then strap everything horizontally, attaching it to the concrete with masonry nails. Then I called in our electrician, Alan Gallant. He rough wired for outlets. We need plenty of outlets, about every six feet, and also provided some wiring for additional lighting. You can never have too much light in a workshop. But here's a really nice feature that he put in, this kill switch right here. When this key is taken out, no one can use the outlets in the workshop. It's a safety issue. It keeps children and unauthorized people from coming in here and using the tools. Now for the walls, we're using one by eight shiplap pine. It's rough on one side, smooth on the other side. And you may think this is excessive, but we found that rather than use pegboard or drywall, by using solid wood, you can attach anything anywhere. Now that that's done, I'm going to install a coat of a beige paint, again, to brighten up the shop. Then we'll bring in the tools, start building our garage workshop. I suppose if there were only one stationary power tool you could buy for the workshop, it would be this, a table saw. We're going to use it to build this garage workshop, and you can use it in every single woodworking project that you do. Now, people are always asking me what kind of features I look for in a table saw. So many of these tools are sold as direct drive saws, which means there's just a motor mounted under the table, and the arbor is part of the actual electric motor. I like a belt-driven saw. The motor is separate. It sits out front, or it hangs down below the saw, and the arbor is driven by a belt. It's a much smoother running saw. I like a cast iron top on the saw. It's very durable, and it's very flat. I want the arbor to be long enough to accommodate a full-size dado head cutter, and I want a really good rip fence, one that slides easily, and when I lock it down, it's parallel to the blade. I like to have an extension on the fence. In this case, I go out to 30 inches, which means I can rip a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood in half, and that accommodates my ripping needs. And lastly, I like it to have it on a mobile base so I can move it around the shop when necessary. 
But before you use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now for our garage workshop, we're gonna build some wall cabinets which will have doors, some open storage, a nice big base cabinet with a good countertop and draw storage underneath. Then we'll build a portable unit that'll come out and hold the miter box and other portable power tools. Now let me assure you that we will have a plan for the garage workshop. It'll list all the materials, all the hardware, and all the tools that are going into the shop. And you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Let's get started with this pile of plywood. I can't tell you how many emails we get about this material. It's MDO plywood, medium density overlay. Plywood substrate, thin paper facing on each side. You can buy it at a well-stocked lumberyard or a home center, or call your plywood supplier. You can leave it unfinished, it's nice and smooth, or you can paint it, and that's why sign painters like it so much. Whenever I work with plywood, I make a plywood cutting diagram to get the most out of each sheet. It's difficult to handle full sheets, so I'm gonna make some initial cuts with a circular saw. I've set up a straight edge clamp, and I'm just gonna let the base of the saw ride right up against the clamp for a nice straight cut. All right, the first cut on our new table saw. Let's see how it works. With several of the strips ripped, I'm making a rough cut for length using the circular saw. Then I'll take the pieces to the table saw and use the miter gauge for the final cut. All right, with one end square, I can measure my length, mark it, and make the cut. Here I've set up the stack dado head. I'll make some test cuts and we'll make some dados for the fixed shelves. Here I'm clamping a sacrificial strip to my rip fence so I can slide it right up to the dado head cutter to make a rabbit for the top shelf. Here I've raised my dado head to 3 8 of an inch and made the first of two passes to create a rabbit for the plywood back. That second pass completes the rabbit for the back. This quarter inch groove in the top shelf will receive the plywood back. I'm now ready to assemble one of the upper cabinets. A little bit of glue in the rabbit. Bring the piece into place, set it flush with the front. Then I take a speed square and just hold it square to the side and then brad it in place with some one and, one and a quarter brads. Now for the intermediate shelves, I'm able to just toenail them. By toenailing the joint, we have a much stronger connection between the side and the shelf. Now with the glue installed on the grooves of the other side, I'll just set it on the ends of the shelves and attach it using the same methods. Next, the plywood back. A little bit of glue. You slip it into the groove in the top shelf. And then I'll secure it with some three-quarter inch brads. Even though this plywood back is only quarter inch plywood, it adds incredible strength to the cabinet and support for the shelves so that they don't sag when they're loaded down with heavy objects. Here I'm tipping my saw blade to 45 degrees to rip some cleats to hang the cabinet. Now the cleat that I just ripped is gonna get attached to the back of the cabinet. And I wanna have it so that the angle goes up towards the back of the cabinet. The cleat for the wall is set to a level line with the bevel going towards the wall. And I just attach it with some two inch screw. Okay, let's hang it up. Now this system is really simple. It has incredible strength. And if you leave, you just take the cabinets with you. Now these units will get doors later and we'll put some open shelves between the two units. In the meantime, let's get started on the base cabinets. 
For the last few minutes, I've been cutting parts for the base cabinets. Each side panel needs a dado to receive the bottom shelf. I've just run a rabbit along the back edge of the base cabinet side. Later, I'm going to install a cleat at the top edge to attach it to the wall. Well, I'm cheating here a bit. I broke out a tool that we built a few years ago on the New Yankee Workshop. It's a chop saw station. The legs can be removed so it makes it portable. The extensions fold around so they're out of the way. And it has this adjustable stop, which is useful for making repetitive cuts. Now, we use it here to build the cabinetry, but it's not going to stay in the shop permanently. All right, I've got the cleat and the bottom shelf attached to one side. Now we'll just attach the other side. A little bit of glue on the ends of the front 2x4 support. Drop that into position and attach it with a few screws. Now I'm ready for the divider to which I'll attach the draw slides later. A little more glue and some brads. That hole is necessary to access the adjustment screw on these leveling feet that I bought from my woodwork supplier. These are just glued in place and attached with a couple screws. All right, that takes care of one of the base units. Before I leave tonight, I think I'll build the other one. Tomorrow we'll make doors for these cabinets, some drawers, and the countertop. Well, good morning. I thought I'd drag out our new benchtop drill press because I'm going to need that a little bit later. Now, last night before I left, I worked out a few of the details. I hung the doors on the wall cabinets, and I'll show you that a little bit later. I assembled the other base unit, and then I worked on a detail that's really important. Anytime you have a kitchen cabinet, or a bathroom vanity, or a cabinet in the workshop, in order to work comfortably at it, you need a toe space. Now, I'm going to close this in later, so I don't have a toe space. So what I did is extended the top by three inches. This also gives me a bigger work surface. Now, this overall length is 26 and 3 quarter inches. If I had ripped that out of a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood, I would have only got one strip. So I ripped the side 23 and 3 quarters, so I get two strips. They don't call us Yankees for nothing. And then I used a piece of scrap for the extension. Now, I attached it with biscuits and glue. So I marked out a location for the slots. I'm going to take my plate joiner and cut the slots for the biscuits. Now it's just a matter of putting a little bit of glue on the biscuit, slipping it into the slot. And then we'll glue up the slots in the extension and clamp it in place. OK. Now we'll just slide it in. And then I have this three-way clamp. I can bring it into the side. First, I clamp it to the carcass, like that, and then just crank this front piece in, and we'll let it set until the glue dries. Even though I built the base unit as two separate units, I want to join them together because it'll make leveling easier. Here's where those leveling feet I installed come in handy. I can level the cabinet all the way around before I fasten it to the wall. It's nice to have a nice big cleat and put the screws just about anywhere. Some two inch screws will do the job. Well, now let's get working on the doors. Just MDO plywood. The trick here is to cut them nice and square. And I've laid out for the hinges. I'm going to use these European cup hinges. 
and they need a 35 millimeter hole to be recessed into the plywood. That's why I brought out the drill press. The hinge just drops into that hole and I attach it with a couple screws. Next I have to attach the corresponding piece of the hinge. The same outfit that sells the hinge sells this little jig. It allows me to drill the pilot holes exactly in the right place. With the holes drilled, it's just a matter of attaching the hinge with a couple screws. Okay, let's put the door on. Just a matter of bringing the two pieces together, snapping it in place, and that's all there is to it. Let's finish the rest of them. Now the next thing I want to do is close the gap on this base cabinet between the doors and the floor. So I have to rip this strip down a little bit narrow. We'll just roll out our table saw. And this is where it's really nice to have the tools on a mobile base. Easy to get them out, lock them so they don't roll around, and power them up to use. Okay, now I'm just going to attach it with a few brads. For the last few minutes, I've been working on the parts for our storage drawers. Now I'm using half-inch thick MDO plywood. I have side pieces, front pieces, and back pieces. I'm running a quarter-inch groove in all of those pieces to receive the plywood bottom. Here I'm expanding the dado to half-inch, and you'll see why in a minute. All right, whenever I change a blade, I unplug the power tool. Here I've installed a stop lock, which is going to be a guide so that as I push the piece through it won't bind up. This half inch dado is going to be for the back of the drawer. While my dado head is still in the saw, I'm nibbling away this notch in the back of the drawer to receive the drawer slides. I've just cut a couple number 10 biscuit slots in the side piece, and that's how I'm going to join the fronts to the sides. I'll cut the slots in the sides, then the fronts. Now the biscuits are going to go in the slots, but look what happens. When I put the front in place, the biscuit is in the slot for the plywood bottom. No problem. I'll just notch the plywood. All right, now a little assembly. Put a bit of glue in the biscuit slots of the side. Drop the biscuits in. Now a little bit of glue in the slots of the front piece. Drop it in place. I'm just going to tip it up and put one nail in the middle to hold it while the glue sets up. Now for the back, a little more glue, drop it in, and once again use a few brads to secure it. Now just tip it up, slide the bottom into place, and then just repeat the process for the other side. I've just drilled a quarter inch hole above the notch on the back of the draw, and that's for these draw slides. It's a full extension slide, and it's actually going to be concealed underneath the draw. Now this pin right here has to go into that hole, and what that does is it keeps the draw from tipping out when you open it. On the underside of the draw at the front, there are these release mechanisms that will attach it to the slide itself. A couple screws holds that in place. Now the slide itself gets attached to the side of the cabinet 
with a few screws. Okay, let's see how it fits. Basically, I just drop the draw on the track, slide it up. Those pins will engage in the back, and the clips will catch in the front. And there you have it, full extension draws. Now, down below here, we're going to have a full width pull-out shelf. We'll make that next. Now, these pieces of two and a half inch wide pine that I've just put a groove in will be used to wrap the pull-out shelf. With my miter box turned to 45 degrees, I'm mitering each corner of the pine to wrap that shelf. Okay, now a little bit of glue in that groove. Drop it over the edge of the plywood, set it in place, and attach it with a brad. Now we're ready for the slides on the tray. This part of the slide just attaches to the bottom of the shelf. The rest of the track gets attached to these plywood blocks at the bottom of the carcass, just sitting right on that shelf. Now I just have to line up the two parts of the track, it's close, and slide it in. Oh. Now we'll be able to pull this shelf all the way out to easily get at our tools. One more to build. Here I'm laying out some of the parts for the countertop. I'm going to use a 2x4 frame on the flat, then some 3 quarter inch plywood, then some quarter inch masonite. Now where the 2x4s intersect, I'm going to use a half lap joint. I've removed half of the material from a cross piece. Later I'll remove the material from these long pieces, glue and screw them together. To make the half laps, I'm using my table saw, once again set up with the dado head cutter. And what I'm going to do is start at the end of the piece and work over to my fence, which is the exact width of a 2x4. For the last half lap on the ends of the long pieces, I've set my rip fence to the left hand side of the saw blade. That way I don't have to look at the mark. I can use my right hand to support the piece. I know when I reach the fence, I got the right size. To secure the lap joints, I'm applying some glue. And once I get it all together, I'll attach it with some one and a quarter inch screws. Good, now we'll attach it to the base. To secure the frame to the carcass, I'm just using some two inch screws in some pre-drilled holes. Okay, now goes on a piece of three-quarter inch AC, and all I'm gonna do with that is attach it with some brads. Well, it's time to clean up. Ah, that's convenient. Now the masonite that I'm using on the top is a good choice because if it gets dinged or ruined, it can easily be replaced. Now last time I was working on this countertop, the 2x4s were half flapped, creating a base, then I have 3 quarter inch plywood, and then I used an inexpensive material to cap it, quarter inch masonite. If it gets dinged or ruined, remove it, put a new piece down. Now today I want to install this woodworking vise. But before I do that, I want to complete wrapping the edge. I'm just using two and a half inch pine with mitered corners. I'm going to set it in place with a pneumatic nailer. And before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Add just a little bit of glue on the miter. And I'll just hold the piece flush with the masonite and nail it in place with some six penny finish nails. All right, well the next thing I want to do is build another base cabinet. It will line up with the upper cabinets. It'll be open storage, no draw but the front will flip up and be supported by some fold-out legs 
as an additional work surface. I'm also going to take advantage of that and mount a router in the top later. I've pre-cut my side pieces, I've set up the stacked dado head cutter, and I'm going to make a groove for the bottom shelf. Here I've raised the dado to 3 8 of an inch, installed this sacrificial strip to make a rabbit for the back cleats. Here I've pre-drilled some holes for screws to attach a cleat, which is going to tie the front of the cabinet together. Okay, with a little bit of glue in the groove, you can set the bottom in place, and I'll attach it with some brads. Now at the top back of the cabinet, I'm applying some glue for this six inch cleat, which I'll use to attach it to the wall. Now this is the front cleat to tie the carcass together, and a little bit of glue and some screws through those pre-drilled holes. All right, with glue at all the joints, I'll attach the other side using the same methods. Now this strip of plywood goes at the back of the carcass underneath the bottom shelf to provide some additional support. And again, just some brads to hold it in place. That half inch hole is so I'll be able to access the adjuster screw on the leveling feet. A Little bit of glue on the block couple screws. Now at the front of the cabinet, there's a filler that goes down to conceal the leveling feet. This one inch spacer, which will go between the cabinets, is so that the flip up top will clear this extension. Another spacer at the back of the cabinet. Okay, let's see how it fits. Just slide it up against the other cabinet, attach it with some screws, and then I'll level up the feet. Here I've set up the dado cutter again, and I'm plowing out material in these 2x4s to make half laps for the fixed top on the cabinet. Some glue on the half laps, and then I'll secure the joint with some one and a quarter inch screws. Now I just take the frame, sit it on top of the carcass, pre drill some holes, and attach it with some two inch screws. Now a piece of three quarter inch plywood. Just attach it with some brads. Now the piece of masonite it just sits on top. And now we'll trim this edge with some more pine. Here I'm installing three hinges on the underside of the countertop. They're used to attach the flip up front. I've ripped four pieces of two by four, two and a half inches wide. And that's gonna be to make the frame for the flip up top. It's going to take two passes to make a rabbit into which I'll set the plywood and the masonite. I've mitered the corners of the frame parts. Now I'm just going to glue each corner and assemble it with some six penny finish nails. Here I'm inserting a piece right down the center for additional strength. Now here are the legs, also made out of some ripped down two by four stock. And I have to round over the top edge. <sighs> Using the bench top drill press, I've just drilled a pilot hole for this special screw 
which is part of the folding hardware for the leg. After switching bits, this hole is for a through bolt. All right, now I can attach the hardware to the leg. I start with this bracket, put a bolt through, then this bar. Everything goes through that 3 16 hole in the leg. There's a drill to get that through. Then on the other side, I put this little bracket. That, and then a locking nut. Next, I call to put this screw in through the angle part of the bracket and the small metal bar. And that takes care of mounting the hardware on the leg. Now the idea is to attach the whole assembly to the frame. Okay, let's see how it works. Locks in place. That's good. Let's put the other one on. In order for the legs to bypass one another, I had to offset the second leg. I've screwed it to the frame, and then I've screwed the other side of the angle to a block, which I'm just going to nail in place from the outside here, and later I'll glue it and attach it to the plywood top. That should be plenty strong. Now the hinges get attached to the frame. Set it in place and get the pins in. Here's the three quarter inch plywood for the top. I had some narrow strips left over from an earlier cut, so I've seamed it over the center support. They don't call us Yankees for nothing. Next comes the quarter-inch masonite. I want to mount a router in this table, so I'm going to take a base and secure it to the bottom a little bit later. Through the base will go a motor into which I can put router bits. I need a hole for the bits to come through the table, so I've located a mark ten and a half inches in from the center, and a two-inch hole should be just right. I've removed the masonite and flipped the plywood over. I've taken the base and laid out a little bit larger than the diameter of the base. The combined thickness of the top between the plywood and the masonite is an inch. That means my bits are going to be greatly compromised in the distance that they can come through the table. So I'm going to relieve or remove some of the material to maximize the use of my bit. To cut it out, I'm using my plunge router, which is set up with a 3 quarter inch straight cutting bit and I'll just freehand the material away. Okay, with some glue in the rabbits, I'm ready to drop the plywood back in, and I'll attach it with some brads. Now, I can set the masonite in place. And now I can put the screws for the base through the pre-drilled holes and see if I can get everything lined up here. Okay, that's good. Now, it's not the most convenient spot to get to under here, but for deep storage, it'll work great. And when it's time to put it away, you just fold up the legs and let it go down to seal off the cabinet. That works great, and it only takes a couple seconds to flip it up and get a nice big work area. Now, there's a couple more things I want to take care of up here. I want to put some shelves, open shelves, with no doors in the middle, and I want to attach my draw fronts. The open shelves are going to sit on some three-quarter by three-quarter cleats, just made out of plywood, 
I pre-drilled holes and I'm using some one and a quarter screws to fasten them. All right, now the shelves just sit on the cleats and I'll put a couple brads just so they won't slide out. And I think I'll rip some strips of pine to dress up the front edge. A little bit of glue where the pine meets the plywood and I attach it with some brads. Now I'm ready to apply my draw fronts. And there's a little trick here. I don't like to measure and try to figure out where the front actually attaches to the box. I like to set it in place, use a couple spring clamps until I get it spaced exactly the way I want, and then I can attach it with some screws from the inside. Okay, now I'm using some one inch screws to attach the front. All right, two more draw fronts to go before I quit tonight. I know I can do it. Uh, I don't know, the forecast said sunshine. I don't think so. Nevertheless, today we should be able to finish our garage workshop. Now during the course of this project, you've seen me use this tool, a chop saw station. We built it a couple years ago and if our email is any indication, this is a very popular project. We built it in response to the carpenters who watched the show. They wanted a place to set their saw while they were on the job. So it's meant to be portable. These extensions fold in, the legs drop out. There are really four parts, a table, two legs, and the chop saw. Now, I like the height because I don't have to bend way down to get a good sight line on the saw blade. Now, if space was no problem, this would be a great choice for the workshop. But we are tight here, so we need something smaller. And we do want to have the miter saw available all the time because you use it in just about every project. So we have to come up with a different design. I want to make a unit that's on wheels so I can bring it out and use it whenever I need it. And I want to maintain that height. I'll have some extensions, but not quite as long as the chop saw station. And I think I'm going to build it in two levels so that I can use the chop saw on one side and then use other benchtop tools on the other side. Put a nice storage drawer in it, close it in with a couple doors, and I think we'll have a nice cabinet. Let's get started. Many of the good ideas for this workshop came from my friends Mark Strahler and Scott Box. They suggested this flip-up work surface. It works great. As I found out this morning as I began laying out the parts, for our mobile unit. What you see here are two pieces of MDO plywood clamped together. This is the top edge of one of the side of the side pieces. I've laid out various aspects of the cabinet. The first thing I want to do is take this section out. This is where the miter box is going to sit and this is where other portable bench top tools will sit. I'm just using a straight edge clamp I'm going to use the circular saw to make the cut. That dado is for the bottom shelf. The chop saw will sit on the shelf that fits in this dado. That dado will close off the low work surface from the upper work surface. This piece is a stiffener. It goes at the bottom of the vertical groove right tight up against the bottom shelf. I'm just going to pin it right here and then I'll attach the piece with some screws from the underside. The next piece is the top where the chop saw will sit. I'm 
Now I have a piece that goes between the upper and lower work surface. I'm going to put these four inch strips next and I'm going to use those to attach the lower work surface. Now I'm going to take the other side, which I've already put the glue and all the dados, try to set it together. Once it's secured in place, I will fasten it using the same methods. All right, let's put it up the way it's going to go and check it for squareness. Okay, on this diagonal I have just about 39. And on this side, just a hair under 39. It's close enough. This two inch rail is gonna be used to support the draw hardware and it'll be a place the doors can close against. I'll attach it with a couple screws through the ends. Next thing I want to do is dress up the front edge of this bottom shelf. I'm going to cut a piece about an inch and a half wide. That'll make it stiffer also. Okay, I've notched the ends of these pieces to fit inside the dado. And I'll just glue it and attach it with some brads. Now while the piece is still up on the workbench, I'm going to attach the door hinges and the draw slides. These are full extension slides and this part couldn't be easier. Just a few screws into the side of the cabinet. Some more one and a half inch wide pine will cover the edge of the countertop and also provide a place to clamp a tool down. While I've still got the cabinet up on the bench where I can work on it, I want to install these plywood blocks underneath the cabinet. It'll give me more wood into which I'll be able to set lag screws which will secure these locking casters. All I'm going to do is apply a little bit of glue and nail them on with some brads. The only part of the draw slide that gets attached to the box is this little clip. Here I'm making some extension wings for the miter box station. I'm just using a piece of three quarter inch plywood and I picked up these fold down shelf supports so I can put them out of the way when I don't need them. I've brought out the portable dust collector because I need it for the next bench top tool, which is this 12 and a half inch surface planer. There's a wide cutter head with a couple knives in it. You can take rough cut lumber and smooth both surfaces to make boards for projects, or you can take stock and thin it down as I need to do here to set our miter box. <laughs> To secure the miter box, I'm using some small fender washers and some drywall screws. Okay, now let's roll it into the storage spot. Now this is going to be a great accessory to have in the workshop. Now there are a couple more items I want to take care of. Here's something I wish I had done earlier at the New Yankee workshop taken a two by four, ripped it down to about two and a half inches, 
put a few long screws through it and attached it to the wall. Now once again, you can see the advantage of this solid wood paneling. I can put anything anywhere I want. Now this is a detail that only takes a few minutes to do, but you'll use it every day storing your clamps. I'm going to take advantage of this wall for lumber storage. So I picked up these heavy duty standards at my home center and these brackets. I snap them in wherever I want and there's plenty of strength here to store my lumber. We've also installed this metal cabinet to store our paints and finishes and other household chemicals. That's a good idea to have this cabinet able to lock, especially if there are children around. This completes the garage workshop. I suspect that this is going to be a very popular project and that many of you will be building a workshop of your own. But remember, work safely.